Okay, let's pray. Jesus, here we are, um, holding your word and offering our hearts to you, settling our hearts as best we can. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us even in that. Lord, if there's anxiety that's rising up or worry or just a discombobulated, foggy mind, that you would help us, that you would give us clarity of purpose and clarity of mind, that we would be able to hear from heaven, not just assume information, but to grow in grace and the knowledge of you, to know you, to know your grace experientially, your unmerited favor poured upon us. You did this for us, Lord, with all wisdom and understanding. You knew what you were doing when you bought us and when you called us to yourself. So, Lord, have your way with your people, with us. We offer ourselves wholly to you. We do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, do you remember the scene that we ended with last Sunday? Uh, Jesus was speaking to the religious rulers of his day, and religious rulers should be an oxymoron, and I think it is, but at this time, they were religious, and they were ruling. They were religious rulers. They were supposed to be stewards. They were supposed to be servants. They were supposed to be stewarding God's people. They were supposed to be serving God's people. They were supposed to be caring for God's people. They were supposed to be cultivating God's people. But instead, they were only enriching themselves. And worse than that, they were interrupting God's people. They were making it difficult for God's people to worship God and to fellowship with God. And unfortunately, it had been, it had been this way for centuries. So Jesus standing before them, God standing before them, told them a parable. And he told them this parable, that there was a man who owned a vineyard who went away for some time. And one day, he wanted to see and wanted to enjoy some of the fruit that came from his vineyard. And so he sent some servants back to his vineyard. And one after another, the stewards beat his servants. They killed his servants. They treated his servants poorly. So finally, one day, the man who owned the vineyard sent his one and only son, sent his beloved son, thinking surely they're going to listen to and respect my one and only, my beloved son. But instead, they captured his son, they killed his son, and they cast his son out of his vineyard. And then Jesus, looking at these religious rulers, asked them a question. What do you think the owner of the vineyard will do to those stewards who killed his son? And then he answered his own question. The owner will come and destroy the stewards and give the vineyard to someone else. And after he finished that parable, I bet you could have cut the tension with a knife. Because everybody, including the common people, but especially the religious rulers, everybody knew who Jesus was talking about. He knew that Jesus, who came from Nazareth, was talking about all of these religious rulers. And nobody talked to the religious rulers like that, even if what Jesus was saying was true. So now, if you remember, how did these religious rulers react? Well, think back. Think back to what we said about how they were making decisions. These religious rulers weren't making decisions based upon truth. They weren't making decisions based upon what was right or based upon what was wrong. Remember how they made decisions? They were making decisions on what was most politically expedient. What would keep them in power? What would increase their power? And remember, Jesus tried to call them out on that by asking them a question. The baptism of John, was it from men or was it from God? Knowing how they made decisions, they, he knew that they wouldn't answer the question because he knew that if they said it was from God, they would anger one group. If they said it was from man, they would anger another group. And since they didn't make decisions based upon what was right or wrong, and since they only made decisions on what kept them in political power, they chose not to answer the question. And it even gave us the thought process last week, remember? It says, they reasoned among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, they feared the people, for all counted John to have been a prophet indeed. So they answered and said to Jesus, we do not know. This is how they made their decisions. 
So now think of how they would react to Jesus after this parable was all over, after this parable of the vineyard was all over, and everyone knew that Jesus of Nazareth just called out the entire religious establishment. How would they react? These were the last verses that we read last week, verse 12, last verse. It says, and they sought to lay hands on him, but they feared the multitude, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them. So they left him and they went away. Can you paint that picture in your mind? Nobody talks to us this way. Oh, there's people around. We don't want to anger the people. We don't want to stay in power. So they walk away. They're not making decisions based upon truth or right or wrong. They're making decisions on how do we please the people who keep us in power. And that is not the way to be a steward. A steward who stands before God serves at the pleasure of God. And these stewards were serving at the pleasure of the people. What they thought would keep them in power. So instead of doing what they thought was right or wrong, they chose to walk away in order to stay in power. What do you think they happened? What do you think happened after they walked away? After they walked away to get away from the people, what do you think was the first thing they talked about when they gathered again in secret? What do you think the first thing was that they plotted how to do now? Well, we need to get together to plot how we're going to trick or trap Jesus so that he is discredited in the eyes of the people, so that he looks foolish in the eyes of the people. How dare he from Nazareth say that we don't know the scriptures? We got to come up with some incredible questions to trap him in his words so that he loses, fool so he loses fans and he looks foolish. We, how do we trap this Jesus? And all of the religious leaders got together in this endeavor. And when I say all, I mean all. Today we're going to see the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and the Herodians. We don't have time to talk about how all of these were different, but we must say that many of them were enemies that would never work together unless they had a common enemy, and they found a common enemy in Jesus. Why? Not because Jesus was telling a lie. Not because Jesus had some sort of major theological misunderstanding, but simply and wholly because Jesus was bad for their business. Instead of stewarding, instead of serving, they were enriching themselves. And Jesus was calling them out on these things in a way that was obvious to the people. And it was obvious to these religious rulers, we need to shut them down, and we need to shut them down now. So... Up to bat first, the Herodians and the Pharisees, two groups that would never work together except to destroy Jesus. So verse 13, let's read verses 13 through 17. Verses 13 through 17 of Mark chapter 12. Verse 13. Then they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. And when they had come, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true, that you care about no one, for you do not regard the person of men, but you teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, Jesus, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. So they brought it. And he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered and said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Man, this whole interaction is slimy, isn't it? It's awful. You get a little bit of the behind-the-scenes look at what their intentions were, what their motives were. These people that were supposed to be stewards, these people that were supposed to be servants, they're acting like snakes. They're slithering up to Jesus, and they're tactically flattering Jesus. Did you notice that? 
hey, Jesus, we know that you're not a respecter of persons and you always answer truthfully. We know you don't fear the people or the Romans. So answer the question, do we pay taxes to Caesar or not? They're trying to trap him by flattering him and then asking him what they think is an unanswerable question. Because if he says, yes, pay taxes to Caesar, they think he'll lose all credibility with the common people. But if he says, don't pay taxes to Caesar, then he's going to get in trouble with the Roman Empire. So answer, is it this or is it that? And Jesus, recognizing their hypocrisy, their two faces, says, give me a denarius. It's interesting he doesn't have one. So can I see one? What does he say? Who's, whose face is on this? Whose image is on this? And whose inscription is on this? Whose writing is on this? And I said, well, it's Caesar's. On one side, there was an image of Caesar. On the other side, there was writing of Caesar. And he hands it back to them. He says, well, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. What did Jesus just do? He turned a trap into an opportunity to teach not just the religious rulers, but everybody around who was listening. And what is he teaching? Hey, listen, whose image is on this? Whose inscription is on this? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. That's not the main point. That's not the main issue. That's not the heart of the issue. The heart of the issue is give to God what is God's. You all, we all have been made in the image of God. That's how we all have value, because we were made in the image of God. And all of us have God's writing on our hearts. He has put eternity in our hearts. Every single person knows, whether they admit it or not, that there is a God and there is a forever, and that our sin has separated us from a holy God, and forever is a long time. We all have been made in the image of God, and we all have the writing of God on our hearts, so give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but that's not the heart of the issue. Give to God what is God's. Give him your whole heart. And this is something that the Pharisees and the Herodians just were not doing. So Jesus calls them out on that. Okay, 0 for 1 for the religious rulers. Who's up to bat next? The Sadducees. The Sadducees were the intellectual opportunists. They were religious rulers, but they didn't believe in any of the supernatural. What's up with that? They were too intellectual to believe in things like angels or, you know, the resurrection. But when I say they were intellectual opportunists, they knew that religion was a vehicle to get them in power and to keep them in power. And the Sadducees were the ruling power of the day. They were some of the worst, willing to entertain the charade of religion as long as it allowed them to maintain their power, their position, their lifestyle. So they came up to Jesus with their best question to try to trap Jesus. Here it is. Mark chapter 12, verses 18 through 27. Mark chapter 12, verse 18. Let's read. Verse 18 says, Then some of the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him and they asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind, and leaves no children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and dying he left no offspring, and the second took her, and he died, nor did he leave any offspring, and the third likewise. So the seven had her and left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, which they don't believe in, when they rise, whose wife will she be? For all seven had her as a wife. Verse 24. And then Jesus answered and said to them, 
It's all their fault for eating her cooking. Seriously, people. <laughs> what are you thinking? No, that's not what it says. Just seeing if you're reading along. Okay. It's not what he said. What did he actually say? Verse 24. Jesus answered and said to them, Are you not therefore mistaken? Because you do not know the scriptures, nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven, which they don't believe in either. But concerning the dead, that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the burning bush passage, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. Oh, I can imagine there's some hesitation on their part to try to trap Jesus anymore. Here they came up with their best question, and Jesus turns the trap into an opportunity to teach. Not just to teach the religious rulers, but everyone who was listening, especially the people that were hindered by the Sadducees, hindered by their unbiblical teaching. He mentions the resurrection over and over again, and then he emphatically says at the end, God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You, Sadducees, you religious rulers, are greatly mistaken because you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. Jesus doesn't dance when people try to corner him with loaded questions. Jesus doesn't dance when people try to corner him with loaded questions, cleverly designed questions, trying to trap him in words. Instead, he answers the heart of the issue and he answers the heart of the person. Did you notice this? Whenever someone comes up and tries to trap him, he doesn't dance and just answer their question. He's not insecure and goes, oh, uh, uh, um, let me tell you. He answers the heart of the issue and the heart of the person. This goes for when they're trying to trap him, and this also goes when someone asks them a genuine question. The next person that comes up to Jesus is, is going to bring a genuine question. He's been listening to these exchanges, and yes, he's part of the scribes, but he's the exception, not the rule. He's this genuine person with a genuine question, and he comes up to Jesus, and he just wants to know something. I remember when we were at a uh, prophecy conference, and I was having a debate with someone who I considered my religious superior on the geographic location of the second coming. And I was a young believer and I was looking into the scriptures and I was, I was really convinced about something and I was like so, it was just so important to me to just like go up afterwards and talk to this prophecy expert to just find out. And the person that was debating with me said, come on, let's go up there. So we walked up and we waited patiently and I asked my question timidly and I just said, hey, listen, I've been reading, I'm a new believer. I think this is where Jesus, this is where he, he, he first lands when he comes back in his second coming. And this great prophecy scholar looked at me and he said, yeah, you're right. Next question. And I was sitting there going, oh, wow, crazy. And I just had a genuine question. And I can imagine that this scribe, probably a young man, he's coming up. He's been hearing these exchanges. He's seeing how Jesus is answering from the scripture, not in a way that he's trying to gain power, but in a way of proclaiming truth and seizing opportunity to teach. And so he has something he's been wondering. What has he been wondering about? Look at verse 28. Mark chapter 12, verse 28. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Meaning the most important. What is the first in priority? The first commandment of all. Jesus answered him. The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. 
Please remember this commandment for when we get at the end. All of this is the black backdrop for something spectacular at the end of our study. This is all laying the groundwork, setting the stage. It's the context for something we're going to see at the end. He asks him, what's the most important commandment? Remember, there's 613 commandments in the Old Testament, and the scribes were supposed to be the ones that knew the law better than anyone else. And there was a debate amongst the scribes as to which one was the most important. And he sees Jesus. He has this incredible understanding of Scripture in a way that he's not trying to entertain power. He's just proclaiming truth. And he says, listen, I have this hunch in my heart, but I want to hear it from you. Which one is the most important? Jesus answers, the first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher. You've spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there's no other but he. And to love him with all the heart and all the understanding, with all the soul and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. Did you see how Jesus got to the heart of the matter and the heart of the person? And the heart of the person who came with a genuine question overflowed like that? There was no tactical flattery in what he said. There was just like an exclamation point of, yes, this is true. (laughs) That's what amen means, like so true, so be it, yes. And here he hears Jesus on a hunch that he had And Jesus answers in a way that not only answers his heart and his hunch, but really expands upon it. And his heart overflows. And he says in worship, to love God with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. That's something that very, very, very few scribes, let alone people, would ever say in this day and age. To say loving God and loving your neighbor is worth more than the sacrificial system. And yet it was. That was the heart of the matter. It was the heart of the person. Jesus didn't want us to be an automaton obeying him. Jesus didn't want us to be involved with some sort of system that sends us to the penalty box whenever we mess up. We can do both of those things without a loving relationship with God. That's what religion is. It's checking boxes apart from a loving relationship with God, and he's never wanted that. He wants you, you. He wants your whole heart. He wants all of you, all of you. He doesn't want your time. He doesn't want your talents. He doesn't want your treasure. He wants you. He wants to walk in fellowship with you. He wants to walk in love with you. He wants to walk in such a natural, genuine, loving relationship that obedience and sacrifice aren't even on the forefront of your mind. It's just fellowship with him and love for him and then love fulfills the law. See? Loving God and loving your neighbor when these two hang, you know, on these two hang, all the law and the prophets. This is why Jesus, when he saw that he had answered wisely, said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Remember, once again, this scribe was the exception and not the rule. And when Jesus speaks again, I think he's trying to protect this man maybe even release this man from these religious rulers who were serving themselves. And so he addresses the scribes directly, 
in the presence of all of the people, he starts again with a question, and he ends with some personal commentary that's pretty scathing. Look at verse 35. Verse 35 says, Then Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple, How is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore David calls him Lord. How is then he his son? And the common people heard him gladly. Jesus asked a question. He said, listen, why is it that the scribes say that the Messiah is the son of David? And David called the Messiah Lord. How can the Messiah be his Lord and also his son? It's a very good question. He was asking the question not to the scribes, but to the common people. And he wanted them to search the scriptures to find out the answer to the question. Here Jesus, not only the son of God, but also the son of man was a descendant of David. But he is also God. And in this way, he can be Messiah and the son of David in the same person. And he has to be. In order to bridge the gap between a holy God and sinful man, he had to be both God and man, 100% God and 100% man. And the common people were hearing these things and understanding these things. And it was infuriating the religious leaders because that's bad for business. Wait a second. If common people can understand the word of God, if they can just read the word of God and then understand the word of God and then apply the word of God all by the power of the Holy Spirit, what do they need us for? We're going to lose our jobs. And in the midst of their fear and trepidation, Jesus says something pretty scathing. Verse 38. Then he said to them in his teaching, beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes. They love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. Okay, now pause and consider. Remember we said this was the black backdrop? This was setting the stage for something pretty remarkable at the end? Think about how all this nonsense had to weigh on Jesus. These were supposed to be his representatives. These were supposed to be his stewards. They were supposed to be caring for and cultivating his vineyard, right? He was away for a time, now he's back. He wants to enjoy fruit with his people, the fruit of their relationship with him, and he finds those who are supposed to be caring, supposed to be cultivating, were using the people, interrupting the people, making it difficult for God's people to worship God. And Jesus was angry and frustrated and exhausted and grieving in his heart. And I tried to put myself in his place in a minute way, and the only thing I could think of is what if I went on a missions trip for a really long time? And what if I was away for a couple of years? And I came back to our fellowship, and I found elders and leaders who were doing something similar, who weren't teaching you, who weren't caring for you, who weren't loving you, but they were preying upon you. They weren't praying with you. They were preying upon you. They were interrupting, making it difficult for you to worship God. I would be so angry and so upset and grieving in my heart and just exhausted at like, Lord, why would you allow this? And I can imagine that this was some of what was Jesus' heart. This is this, this dark day when he's dealt with all these people who are just trying to score points in the eyes of the people by trying to take him down with traps and words. And this is just all silly. It's stupid. It's wrong. And as he's sitting there and thinking about all of this, something happens. He sees something. He sees someone. Someone who gets it. Someone who 
who knows what it is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Who does he see? What does he see? Look at it with me, verse 41. Verses 41 to 44. Imagine Jesus standing there leaning against some pillar or something, exhausted, grieving, frustrated. It says in verse 41, now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how people put money into the treasury and many who were rich put in much. And then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrant. So he called his disciples to himself. Can't you just see him? Oh, oh, guys, 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 come here, come here, come here. He called his disciples to himself and he said to them, Assuredly, look, 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 look. I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. And remember, context is important. If you look at this passage of Scripture out of context, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about proportions. Rich people given a certain amount, it's not as high of a proportion as poor people giving in a certain amount. And in context, that's not what this is all about. What is this all about? Jesus is seeking genuine worshipers. Genuine worshipers with no angle, no guile, not trying to get in power or stay in power, not looking at serving in Christianity like a ladder. They just want to serve in secret, serve behind the scenes, serve in such a way that glorifies the Lord without the left hand knowing what, without the left hand knowing what the right hand is doing. And here this woman comes up, no fanfare, no trumpet. Do you know they literally did that? Steve is about to give. One, two. This woman comes up. She probably thinks that no one is looking, no one is watching, and that's exactly how she wants it. And guess who saw? God. Jesus. And it made his day. All these people, supposed to be stewards, serving themselves. It's exhausting and frustrating. And Oh, oh, oh guys, guys, look. <laughs> you guys who I'm trying to teach, you guys who are going to be here after I'm gone, there it is. There it is. She's loving the Lord God with all her heart, mind, soul, and strength and loving her neighbor as herself. And this has nothing to do with money. It has everything to do with her and her relationship with the Lord. This is I love you, Lord. Here's my everything. And isn't that our prayer to God? Lord, how do I... How do I give my everything, my all? How do I give all of my time to you? How do I give all of my talent to you? How do I give all of my treasure to you? I think it's in simply acknowledging whose it is. But everything I have is yours. My time is your time. My talents are your talents. My treasure is your treasure. Now, what are we going to do together? I want to walk with you and serve you and hear your voice and walk in those good works that you prepared for me. What do you want to do today, Lord? Who, who, do, who do you want to bless? I want to be a part of it. I want you to have my everything. I'm yours. This is what worship is. And Jesus is seeking genuine worshipers. Don't you want to be one? Let's go to him together and ask him how. Jesus, here we are, and we're so thankful that you've recorded for us in the scripture cautionary tales. Where one bad decision and a lot of time can get us into a really bad place. Lord, we come here to continually reorient ourselves on what is true and right and good and lovely and excellent and admirable and praiseworthy and we come to you every time we open up the scriptures to have you renew our mind and 
to have that experience like that scribe had and say, oh yeah, that's right, I remember, yes, Jesus, that's what it's all about. And then to be able to walk in the simplicity that is in Jesus with great joy and great strength, whether or not anyone ever sees, whether or not anyone ever reciprocates, whether or not anyone ever cares. Lord, you see us. You're with us. We want to walk in fellowship with you wholeheartedly. So Lord, the best we know how, here is our everything. It's yours. You bought us with your blood. We love you. Help us to walk with you by the power of your spirit. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.